day two of a conference, and we've got this much energy. Thank you for coming out here, seeing us. We're here to talk about something very, very important, and some of the later conversations today, including from a person who goes by one name, um, is going to be basically building, to some extent, off of what we're talking about today, which is what is Web3? What is the future of the internet? Why does it matter? Who's building it? And why should you care? So my name's David Waxman. I'm the founder of Waxman, which is the biggest communication and strategy company in crypto. More importantly, we are long-term and proud supporters of the Futurist Conference and Tracy, who has done an extraordinary job of bringing together some of the thought leaders from around the world here to Canada. Um, but joining me today are four fantastic panelists. And you're, as you're going to see, these are the exact right people to talk about the future of the internet. So let's start with Clayton over here. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Clayton Hartford, uh, one of the directors at Brave, focused on strategic partnerships, uh, Toronto born and raised, uh, and really happy to be here. Excellent. Louise Sabai, great to be back here again. I'm, uh, I work on crypto strategy and partnerships at the Stellar Development Foundation. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Rodriguez, director of strategy and enablement at Unstoppable Domains. Hey, everyone. I'm Ehsan, co-founder of Functionland, and my background is in engineering and development, application development. Okay, so we have ourselves here, and we're going to go into detail a little bit. People who have created the front end, very often the first way that people access Web3 with Brave. We've got people building the infrastructure that can often go to the very last mile in countries around the world with Stellar. We've got uh, Unstoppable, which is building some of the NFT platform and really core infrastructure that's literally why we're going on Web3 and Function Land, which is very important in the accessibility of it, the core storage infrastructure. So as you can see here, assembled are experts who can talk about how Web3 is going to be made and why it's different. So let's dig straight into it. I have one question that is super simple that no one ever seems to be able to answer. Maybe you guys can do that. What is Web3? Why don't we start with you? Oh, uh, yeah. So really, and what by is the way, make sure this is an answer that actually makes sense, please. Thank I you. try. <laughs> so what is really Web3 beyond hype and speculation? Well, I believe Web3 is this tool set that empowers users to evolve into owners. Basically, like it, it, the only other group that calls consumers users are drug dealers. And we can do better than that. So basically, Web3 is changing don't be evil to can't be evil. And, Lockstack uh, thanks you for using their tagline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, you know, like, like uh, Web3 allows me right now to store my money in a piece of flash drive, give it to you without uh, any intermediary, you know, any middleman. That's something very powerful. And we believe that we need to do the same for data because data is the new gold. So that, and that's what we are doing at Function Land, basically decentralizing data. And uh, you know, like the difference between Web3 and Web2 is very apparent in the world's views. Like Web2 is all about customers, bringing customers, expanding customers. Web3 is about your community. So you're talking about the theme at this point. Okay, but, but we'll go into themes in a little bit, but let's, let's stick to the definition for a moment. Louisa, you had an interesting definition of Web3. Sure. Um, simply put, I think Web3 gives users the option to take back the ownership should they choose to want that control. Okay, so that's neatly defined. I like it. Eric, what do you think? I think another aspect of it is to allow users or individuals to own their identity, right? So meaning that they're able to say, I am Eric Rodriguez.crypto, and this is all the data attached to me, and if I want to give you access to that data, I'm able to decide if I'm going to do that or not. Okay, so there's, there is a permissioning element, but there's an identity element that's a prerequisite well. to that. Is that that's correct? correct? Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Clayton? So I agree with all of you guys and girls, um, but I'm just going to keep things really simple for those that are just kind of learning about this. Uh, if, you, if you think of Web3, one word is just decentralization. Now, two words that kind of represent decentralization, it's freedom and control. So you have more freedom uh, on the internet, you have uh, more control over your data, whether that's your identity, whether that's your digital footprint as you surf the web or you uh, search anything online. Um, and it also gives you more control over that identity. And I think we're all here because we want to have more control over um, our assets. All right, 100%. well, I think you know, you've, you've given us a great place to jump off. Brave initially 
was known as a web browser. Yep. Is this a sneaky way to get people into Web3? No. Um, no, I think it, Brave started off as an idea from the creator of JavaScript, who's also the same gentleman that uh, created Mozilla Firefox. So he, he's, he's a professional at creating browsers. I like to kind of consider him as like the Gandalf of the internet. And we're really focused on privacy and security. Um, and we want to really, when people think of privacy and security online, we want them to think of Brave. So we've kind of dominated the browser space in terms of web. You've had extraordinary growth. Yeah, we're at about 62 million monthly active users, adding about 4 million users every yes. month. Yes, give them a round for that one. So naturally, um, you know, starting off with, with a browser, what do people do in their browsers? Well, they spend most of their time uh, and most of their attention in the browser. Um, but we also spend a lot of time with our search engine. So Brave now has a search engine. Brave now has a wallet. It's one of the only wallets that actually ships natively uh, to your browser, so you're not downloading potentially uh, malicious extensions. Um, and we've also kind of just scaled out our, our product line to video conferencing um, and, and, and a lot more that I can't talk about. Okay, well, we'll talk about things you can talk about today, <laughs> um, including that search engine, which I think is very important. Uh, and I think we're gonna be seeing, talking more about the principles, as you were saying earlier, of why Web3. Um, at Stellar, of course, you're thinking about Inclusion. Um, is Web3 legitimately going to be more inclusive than Web2? And why? Yeah, good question. I think we all have a role to play in driving forth the growth of Web3, and I think Stellar specifically has always been focused on building that bridge between the physical world and the world of Web. Um, so I would like to think that Web3 can be built more inclusively compared to Web2, because you look at right now, if you don't if you can't access the web, or if you can't access the things that you will ultimately be paid for on the web, um, how can one benefit from a, a, a new version of web 2.0? So to some extent, I'm optimistic, but at the same time, let's not forget that we can't, um, we still need to pay for food, we still need to be able to pay our rent, and how do you provide that on and off ramp into the world of web? Yeah, well, I mean, it's worth noting, right now, most people cannot pay their rent in crypto. They cannot. Not in Bitcoin, not in Ether, not in Lumens. Uh, not in Lumens right now. Um, hopefully, we'll get to a world where stable coins can be used to pay for rent, to, be, to pay for food, because I think that's probably more palatable for a regular user to know that their assets isn't going to be moving uh, as volatile as Bitcoin or Lumens. Well, we've seen millions of people, of course, initially in, in the run up in 2017, 2018, buy Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. We then saw a really interesting phenomenon that was accelerated in early 21, which was the rise of NFTs. Um, it's likely that many millions of people, of additional people, new people, have begun their Web3 journey for the very first time with NFTs. What's Unstoppable's view? of the future of NFTs? So Unstoppable approaches NFTs from a slightly different perspective in that we're providing human readable NFT domains to individuals to really make it easier to enter the world of crypto. Right? Can, can you explain why that's a real problem sure. first, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm not alone in um, sending someone crypto and just praying and hoping that it arrived, right? Because you're like, I really hope that was the right address. Um, but with Unstoppable, you're providing human readable NFT domains like ericrodriguez.crypto so that you are attaching all of the different addresses that you have to that specific NFT domain, which means that you're able to send money with a peace of mind. And obviously, if you're not familiar with the world of crypto, that's a far easier entry point then than having to send... Remembering hexadecimal, exactly, for example? Exactly, yeah, and hoping that it arrives, right? Like, I don't think you're gonna ask someone to send $100 when they can't pay their rent and hope that it arrives. Like, we need to move past that, and I think Unstoppable was really thinking of how to help solve that problem. I mean, this is, seems like a pretty fundamental issue to solve. Yep. Like, how is this not solved two, three, four years ago? Is there a reason why it uh, wasn't? That's a wonderful question. I'm not sure why, but uh, we're trying to solve it now and help people own their identity. Yeah, it's critical well, to solve it. I, I think what we're seeing here is that there are still some building blocks, some very w without basic building blocks that must exist. I mean, we're, we're very much at the 1% mark, right? Like, there's okay. so much room to grow, and I think everything that we've mentioned so far highlights that. What does Function Land think about this? I mean, storage, is a very important part of, of Web2. And in fact, and I, I, perhaps this is controversial, but I'd say that AWS, Google Cloud, and others have done a pretty good job of making storage, cloud storage, accessible to regular people, to regular businesses. It's not all that challenging. It's easy to spin up. What's the problem with Web2 storage? 
Well, first, the thing is it's not just the storage that AWS and Google is doing, it's organizing and processing our data, our raw data, creating knowledge out of it, like I put my photos on Google Photos, they tag my friends, they tag the data and location. That's what we are getting from them. And the problem here is actually, I can elaborate it with exactly Google Photos. Like it started as this free application, very innovative, features was being added to it frequently, and users trusted it. They put year, years and years of memories there, and after like, they had this edge over competitors, they created this monopoly, they stopped the innovation. Last year, they rock pulled millions of users, ending the free tier. And guys, this is insane that a big company rock pulled so millions. So the biggest companies are the ones doing the most impactful rug pulls? It's not yes. just NFT scammers? <laughs> Exactly. Okay. <laughs> it's big companies rock pulling us, and we don't have any other option to turn to. You know, like, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to Microsoft? It's the same thing. So we need an alternative, and that's what we are creating at Function Land, an alternative that is people-owned. I back up your data, you back up my data, so you are the owner of your data. It's no one else, no central entity. And to be very clear, you're partnering with other part experts, I should say, and, and organizations that are trying to tackle, for example, NFT storage, NFT, and, or, I mean, I should say decentralized storage, decentralized compute, and other types of services, is that correct? Exactly, actually, we are trying to partner with all Web3 creators. As I said, Web3 is all about collaboration, not competition. So we partnered with uh, Filecoin Protocol Labs on our uh, protocol side. We really well, like to partner with Brave and Unstoppable the Wains to create this decentralization into the hands of people who want to have websites, personal websites on their own storage, and we go from there. Okay, so then I think that leads into the ethos of Web3. I think we've well defined what Web3 is, and you've seen there's a, a number of definitions, but most of them have to do with some semblance of user control of data. Um, as far as whether or not that's important, I think that's something worth talking about. But before that, let's talk about some of the guiding principles behind this. Because there were guiding principles to, before even Web 2, the internet in the first place. Let's not forget that this was something that was initially invented for military applications and for essentially academic applications that would benefit the military in the United States. And it's expanded since then. And it's become the place, for example, where information was meant to live free. Maybe that's a definition of why the internet existed in the first place um, when we saw that encyclopedias like Wikipedia could exist. What do you think is the driving force behind why people will adopt Web3? Are they today afraid, uh, Clayton, that their data is being mined? Is that the real reason? Are people that worried about large corporations? Or do you think there's something deeper? Um, I think that you know, people are just starting to, to wake up to the fact that we don't even own our, own our own digital identities and that our entire digital footprint is actually being owned and manipulated by all these random third parties that we've never heard about. Um, and I really think that, that this is going to change, and I hope everybody here like really takes note that you, you can kind of take your identity into your own hands with unstoppable domains. You can put up a shield and block cookies and third-party trackers by using the Brave browser. But I kind of use this example. Like back in the day, people used to smoke in hospitals. People used to smoke cigarettes in airplanes, smoke cigarettes um, in, uh, in classrooms. And we look back and think, that is so fucking crazy, right? And I think that we're going to look back and say, wow, I just gave all of my closest personal information to the Facebooks, the Googles. I even created an Instagram account for my, ba for my baby. And um, you're just giving all of that away. And it becomes more difficult to take that information away from these corporations and into your own hands. And I think that with Web3, we're going to be able to say, hey, you know what? I don't trust you guys anymore. I don't like what you've been doing in the press or with politics. I'm going to take my data off your platform, and you'll never have it again. And I think uh, it's time for all of us to kind of just put our shields up and to take things into our own hands. Wow. That sounds pretty powerful to me. But will people do that? Do you think that there's actually a drive, Louisa, for people to go and, and go off platform with these things? Because, I mean, to be honest, yeah. and uh, let me make an argument, first pro, but I'd love to hear your stance. In the age of the upcoming metaverse, where our lives are increasingly via e AR, via VR, perhaps some other experience, going to be digital. Our digital identities go from more than just an aside, more from just something that we only care about with a function of our day. I mean, screen time 
on my iPhone tells me I spend way too much time looking at things. And perhaps people will become afraid uh, in the future to an extent they're not today. But is this a real problem or is it one we're manufacturing? I, I really think it depends on who you are and how much you care about these large tech companies owning that piece of information and possibly targeting you with ads that you otherwise wouldn't receive. Um, I'm a little torn here because um, from one side I feel like I get annoyed receiving all of these Instagram ads every time I, I type something in, in, in WhatsApp. I feel like someone's listening. But at the same time, I would much rather have these targeted ads versus things that I don't care about. Um, and at the end of the day, I do think some of these large, there, there's a time and place for centralization. And the example I like to use is during the pandemic, Amazon came through with toilet paper. Um, Shopify came through with enabling small, medium businesses another option for them to sell their goods and services on the internet. So um, let's not, you know, paint these large tech companies as the bad, evil organizations. There's still a role for them to play in Web3, and you want to give ultimately the users the option should they want to control these aspects of their their own assets when when they find it to be beneficial to them. That makes sense to me. Um, it seems super practical to uh, potentially embrace them. But I also would think perhaps some of these organizations are innovative enough to be experimenting today. Maybe they're going to make use of the technology that all of you are premiering right now because they know that that's what users are going to want in the future and they'd rather cannibalize themselves than be eaten alive by competition. Without a doubt, I think that's the case. I mean, just going off of what Luisa was saying, um, it, I think it comes down to financial education, right? Like individuals need to understand the power that they could hold if they own their data. So if we think about last year, for example, the big Web2 companies made $100 billion by selling your data. Right? If you think about the creator economy. You said $100 billion? $100 billion, yeah. If you think of the creator economy, Andreessen Horwitz released a report of the state of crypto in May that said that um, Facebook was paying per creator 10 cents and OpenSea was paying 174 k right? I'm not saying that we're all going to make 174 k by owning our data, but there's a real financial impact by us being able to be the ones that control the narrative. Even getting a discount would be awesome, right? Like if instead of Nike paying Facebook to advertise to me, I was able to tell Nike, Nike, I'll tell you my, sho my shoe size if you give me a discount and I get a 25% discount because Nike doesn't have to pay Facebook anymore as an intermedi intermediary, that's a win. Right? And See, I think there's this a makes sense to me as a consumer. Yeah. This is a real reason to use Web3 exactly. tech. Exactly. Yeah. But Nike just doesn't want your shoe size. <laughs> they want more. But okay. What do they want to know? What else do they want? Do they want my genetic code? Not uh, yet. <laughs> but I'm, maybe they're gonna. If you give them the, your genetic code, they can customize the right shoe, the right you know. Or maybe they turn into a data brokerage because they make more money doing that than they do mm -hmm. selling shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because. They're using the Nike fitness app. They see maybe that ties into how often you're working there, out, there what kind is. of workouts they've, they've you're doing. They've already got it. Wow, you just made me really <laughs> creeped out by Nike. I already got it. I never would have thought that. Okay, so I guess where do we go from here? Um, what major problems, I guess, perhaps collaborating together, could we solve in web, with Web3 that aren't being solved today? I'm sure many of you are dreaming about the building blocks that you're making today coalescing with others to try and solve a, a material problem. What needs to be solved that isn't today? I'll jump on. I think uh, you know, a big problem that exists today is security. So we're seeing you know, every, every month, every year, every quarter, every week, I mean, every day, there are people getting, getting scammed in Web3. Um, and I think that you know, we need to um, all take security into our own hands um, and not be relying on, on third parties. Uh, for our entire digital wealth. Um, and I think if we all come together, whether it's you know, just everyone on stage here, everyone um, that has a booth here, just coming together to take privacy and security together, I think this world will be a better place. I mean, identity theft, speaking of security, is a real problem. It has destroyed many lives. Many people here have probably had their credit card stolen before. I mean, is this something that you think that together we can solve? Yes. <laughs> and then how, like legitimately? Well, I think one, one thing that I'm thinking about is just, you know, you saw the situation with Solana, or it, wasn't, it, was, it was a situation that happened on the Solana blockchain and right. had to do with... With many of the wallets. The slope wallet. 
And it was, there was someone able to gain control of these wallets without ha having the person involved at all. And I think, you know, how, we, how can we partner together? There's some people here working on hardware. There's some people working on software. If there's ways that we can do a better job of authenticating um, access to wallets, authenticating transactions, um, I think that that's, that's, that's how we can all fix this problem. Anything else come to mind? And actually, there is one thing that I believe we should solve to, to make the blockchain and Web3 into the consumer's world. That's the utility of it. Like, right now, Web2 provides a lot of diverse utilities to us, like from, from everything we do that, that's on Web2. So we need to have the same experience for the users in Web3. Like, they, sh they should have the same YouTube application, the same Netflix applications in Web3. And that would what, what's, what would be driving the... Well, the so that users. gets us into adoption. I think yeah. that's really what you're speaking to. And right now we've seen, I believe, that the rise of NFTs have been a vehicle for adoption of this. Um, the fact that large brands that people are used to have embraced Web3 through NFTs has made an impact. And I know many of you probably you know, would shit on McDonald's for, for it, but I think it's actually a good thing. Finally, people have a reason to own a wallet without necessarily having to buy crypto in the first place. But what are the, what are the other ways for us to get millions or even billions of people on board this. I mean, I think at Brave, you've been thinking about this problem very specifically from one side. And I love Stellar's opinion as well um, on the matter because you're thinking about a totally different subset of the global population. But at Brave, how are you thinking about how to get more people involved? I think at, at its core, we're just trying to build a, a safer internet experience. So if you have someone says, hey, you know what? Um, download Brave, it blocks YouTube ads. Or hey, download Brave, you're gonna get a cleaner experience to, to, uh, to read articles. And then all of a sudden you realize, whoa, I actually have a, a Web3 wallet built into this browser. And wow, I just started earning basic attention tokens from passively surfing the web. Now you have 62 million people around the world that are participating in Web3 without anybody even knowing about it. And I think it, it's just all about user experience and keeping things simple. Let what me about add inclusion? On yeah, go on. Let me add on to that. So think about the people who actually don't have access to crypto right now because they don't have bank accounts or they don't have a way to transfer money onto an exchange to access crypto and then purchase yeah. that. Um, through Stellar and our MoneyGram um, partnership, you can actually physically walk into a MoneyGram store with cash where they will convert um, USDC on Stellar and then have it deposited into your crypto wallet. So maybe we can build something between Brave and Stellar where you, your wallet can hold USDC on Stellar Love it. and then you know, magnify the users that can access and um, you know, get involved in Web3. Or maybe even have some sort of, I, I guess, further mechanism for people to download Brave. Beyond simply the wallet existing, maybe there's a, a discount of some sort yep. um, through some third party retailer. It's only activated via downloading Brave. There we go. But I mean, these things are important. They're not just conversations. This is how millions of people are gonna finally use technology that everyone in this room already cares about. Um, and so I, I don't think this is just pure philosophy. Yep. I know it starts there, that's the thing. We were yep. talking about why Web3. Um, it's easy for us to philosophize. But I think what really matters is for us to be talking about how it's gonna practically go and help lots of people. Whether it's a discount, whether it's a, a new way of, of financial inclusion, whether it's simply a cleaner browsing experience. These to me, at the very least, feel like reasons to adopt Web3. Reasons yeah, to believe. And, and I think that's like what we are talking about here is making it more accessible, easier for anyone to jump on. Like, like if we make it something that anyone can experience with, with a few clicks. I believe many users would jump on and start using that Web3 application or that, that use case. But it, if they have to run a scripts, they have to, I don't know, like sit, sit behind the computer and read lines of codes, obviously the, the less people would be interested in doing that. So we yeah, should I mean, make I, it accessible. I think that gets to interface, right? Like as builders in the space of Web3, we need to be cognizant of how we're onboarding users, right? And making that onboarding flow as intuitive as possible and as easy to access. And you got to think about the bridge between Web2. There hasn't been a lot of that always in crypto. I mean, yeah. my God, a yeah. lot of this stuff's complicated. It's very complicated. And you got to think about the bridge between Web2 and Web3 if you're really trying to hit that growth, right? It's like when you purchase an NFT domain from Unstoppable, you can use a credit card to do that, right? And that, that's kind of that easy transition for someone who doesn't know anything about Web3 to start entering the space. And I think we got to think about that a bit more as we're building, as we're building in the space. All right, so there's a, another element to all of this. Um, and I think this is both important from financial inclusion, important from a mainstream adoption perspective, which we've seen the rise of play to earn, almost anything to earn, move to earn, 
it seems like these, I'm gonna call them better than free experiences, have the potential to go and get people to own an asset which has material, potentially liquid value very quickly, which is A, something for them to lose, but also something for them to gain, to build on top of, right? Perhaps they can use that as collateral to get a loan, um, to build a business. Perhaps they can use it to, I don't know, be part of a new type of community through access-driven tokens um, as well. So what do you guys think all about this? That is to say, are the, what are the routes that you think are going to be most popular to getting people on board? And are these going to be the fundamental and important applications in Web3, these better than free experiences? Eric, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about incentivizing people to check the world out, right? But I think it's also helping them understand how to make their lives easier. So play to earn being one example, but I like to think of medical data, right? So for example, today, if I go to my doctor and, I, and I'm moving to a new city, I have to have my doctor transfer that data themselves to the new doctor, right? And they won't give me the data. So if I'm all of a sudden in Canada, I'm not from Canada, I'm from New York, something happens to me, I don't have my medical records with me to be able to let the doctor know how to it's treat crazy. me best, right? So I think if we're able to own that data ourselves and carry that data with us, the chances of us getting an accurate diagnosis increase dramatically. And that's huge. That's like, you're actually gonna save my life? That that is going to, if people understand that, that is going to change how people feel about Web3 and wanting to explore and build more within that space. Just one thing I want to add is we are not like, Web3 builders are not incentivizing like storage or playing. These are data that is by nature valuable and right now the value is being captured by like a third party. We are just making, enabling users to capture that value themselves. So when we say it's play to earn, it's like not earn from us, it's earn from your own data. So you're saying, so that's the ultimate, uh, I should say, initial or originator of value, is your own data, your own identity, your own time. Exactly. And that, perhaps your own attention. Your own attention, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so what are we missing? What, what do we think is most important in the Web3 space that's been solved? I asked this question previously. We've had a couple minutes to think about it. What's missing? Uh, as I said before, I believe utility is still missing. Like, what does utility mean in this case? Exactly the same experience that users get from the cloud, from, from the applications that exist on the cloud, on this new like, uh, Web3 so space. So we need to replicate Web2 but better, is that correct? Exactly. Okay, better, faster, cheaper, built on Web3, with the right motivations behind it. Yeah, you and know that we, we have like Google Chrome, on the other side we have Brave that provides the same functionality, that's an advancement. So we need now a YouTube, a Netflix, a, like applications. So is this kind of like skeuomorphism with the iPhones where initially when they came out, you, it looked like a notepad, but eventually people got it and they no longer needed that reference to something, physical paper, something like that? Correct. Yeah, you know like actually interesting that Peter Schiff once said, Bitcoin doesn't have any value because if you drop it, it doesn't make a sound. So it's not a sound money. And we Web3 builders are creating that the sounds and shapes for Web3. So adding utilities to it, it takes time. Like Web2 has been around for a couple of years, so it takes time, but we are getting there. Like we are adding utilities to it. Well, we have just a couple minutes left, and I wanted to back up and talk a little bit more about that search engine. So I think everyone here knows, I think everyone probably in the whole world even if they don't have the internet knows that Google has been the repository of almost all data in the world. They have been collecting, not so silently, everything we search, everything we look at. Very often our phones are run with Google operating systems. I mean, this company, the Don't Be Evil company, is aggregating everything. But it's a big problem they've solved. The reason why Bing and others have not been able to outcompete them is it's really hard to get good, accurate search data. So how are you at Brave tackling this enormous problem, which I would say might be the most important thing in Web3? So um, I would say the f first way we're tackling this is from building it from the ground up ourselves. A lot of the search engines that are alternative to Google, they actually rely on big tech. So they're actually relying on Google searches or, or Microsoft searches. So how we're solving this is doing it from the ground up. Um, and then it, it's about education. So what, what's missing here, it, it, it's education. Um, there's not enough people in Web3. Uh, we're growing at a good clip, kind of similar to how the internet evolved. But um, it's education and, and having people kind of wake up to um, what's out there, what's being collected. And just when you, after this conference, go and, and tell, you know, three, five people about 
your experience here, what, what fascinated you, and, and start onboarding people into crypto yourselves. Have them download Brave, have them try out a new search engine. Um, and the only way this search engine is gonna get better is if we all use it. So the search engine is relying on um, people's behavior. Um, obviously everything you do in Brave stays on your device, we don't collect it, but it's the only way the search engine is gonna get better is if, we, if everyone here uses it. So we'd love your help. Well that sounds like a pretty good mission for all of us. Uh, we have time for just one last answer, I guess stemming from yours here, which is, what are you most excited about and what would you like this crowd to do if they could once they leave this stage? Louise, why don't we start with you? I'll go last. Let me think about okay, that one. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. Eric. Um, I'm excited about seeing a future where there's a very easy interface where all of the apps that we're creating come together and allow people to control their data through that connection, right? Um, I'll give you a silly example, but for example, um, I want tickets to the Adele concert, and they're very difficult to get, right? If I could have someone build um, some way for me to be able to let Adele know that I went to her concert in 2009, and I'm a loyal fan, and I should be prioritized, right? Like, I'm deciding what data I'm giving to uh, Adele and company so that I could then get a ticket. Like, building interfaces that allow us to share the data that's critical to us to get the outcome that we want and share and be rewarded for that fandom or whatever it might be, that, that I think would be a, a future that people will get excited about and really just be able to easily make that jump into the world of Web3. Okay, well, now I know what to get you for your birthday. Thank you so much. What do you think? Yeah, the future that we see is like a future that there are, there is innovation happening because there is no monopolies, like developers can create applications, open source applications, which are monetized, monetized, like making money for them. And people own their own data without like the hassle of going through a change. So they are still experiencing the same smoothness, the same applications of Web2, but owning their data. So no ads, no subscription fees, no surprises from So if tape. you had a call to action for everyone here, you'd say learn more about why you should own your own data? I would say if you are still paying for your data for your apps, go check out decentralized storage and see how it can help you. Okay, well, Louisa. Yeah, I, I think I'm still pausing on the, I'm still thinking through how can we create more accessibility to Web3? Mm. So um, if you or any of your friends, like even on my Uber drive here, my Uber driver is from Venezuela. And he was asking me about this, this conference and he said, which crypto exchange do you use? How do you get access to this? How can I get involved? Um, I would say go out and, and, and tell your friends and family about what Web3 means to you and ultimately give them the, the option to choose what aspects of their, their data do they want control over and then look into how they can take that control. I love it. Well, I think the instructions are pretty clear. Go tell a friend. Go tell your family yes. all about Web3 and have them download Brave. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.